greet you, beloved saints, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is my great honor and joy to welcome you to yet another episode of Happy Homes. Today we are talking about parenting for heaven. Well, friends, if you are excited and if you know you're going to enjoy this, I want to challenge you. Please type hashtag Happy Homes before you make a comment and make sure you tag someone that you'd want to hear this message. May God bless you as you do that. Our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed. Shall we invite the Lord as we begin uh, this episode? Our Father who art in heaven, beloved Lord, we come before your throne of grace. Here we gather to speak about one uh, of the virtues of life, talking about parenting our kids for heaven. Bless us as you speak through this vessel. In Jesus' name, let all the saints say amen and amen. Once again, viewers, wherever you're watching from, we want to welcome you to this um, Happy Homes, a channel that is uh, dedicated to create homes uh, that will make a little heaven here on planet Earth. Like I said, today I'm going to focus on one of the issues that we need to talk about in this contemporary world. That is the issue of parenting. I've decided to entitle my discourse, Parenting for Heaven. Parenting for Heaven. I'm going to focus on seven things that I think are very vital for the uh, parents today and those who are aspiring to be parents to consider as we try to develop characters in our children after the similitude of Christ. You know, seven is the number of perfection. So we hope that uh, this will probably help you become a better parent. Let me make a disclaimer. These are not exhaustive in themselves, but these will form a clear foundation in making sure that you create an attitude in your children that will make them useful in this world and that they will make them useful also for the world to come. Allow me to uh, lay down the seven things before I talk about them. We're going to talk about these seven things. Number one, love the child. Number two, discipline the child. Number three, train the child. Number four, invest in that child. Number five, model the child. Number six, you need to play with your children. And most importantly, praying for the child. Uh, we are going to use the text that comes from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 as our launching pad. The book of Deuteronomy says in chapter 6, verse number 4, right up to verse number 8, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently unto thy children. You shall talk of them when they sit in the house, when they walk by the way, and when they lie down, and when they rise very early in the morning, and you shall bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between their eyes. May the good Lord add a blessing to the reading of this word. For those who study the Bible, they consider this passage of scripture as the Shema. In other words, God as it were speaking to the parents uh, under his voice in times past. You realize that during um, the patriarchal time, God spoke ipsis vox to the people that were he was leading. So when God spoke to the children, he says, hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You must love your Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which the Lord was commanding to the people of Israel, he says, you must keep them in your heart. But what I like the most, he says, you must teach them diligently unto your children. In other words, God was giving a commandment to his people to say, should you forget everything else, one thing that you must do as you parent your children, you ought to teach them diligently to be useful in this time that we are living and that they might become candidates for the heaven that is coming. So this is our foundation for what we are going to learn. Alas, we are going to look at the seven things that we want to talk about. Number one, as I had already indicated, we must learn to love our children. For if we love our children, we are putting them closer to ourselves as they grow closer to God. Now, one of uh, the people that I love the most, a well-known writer, says, 
Above all things, parents should surround their children with an atmosphere of cheerfulness, courtesy, and love. A home where love dwells and where it finds expression in looks, in words, in acts is a place where angels delight to dwell. Friends, let me tell you, if there is any virtue that anyone loves, it is love itself. I don't know uh, the basic description or explanation or definition of love, but I want to use the one that I've heard in times past. Someone told me that love is the feeling that you want to feel before the felt feeling, after the feeling that you feel, so that the felt feeling becomes the feeling that you want to feel because of the feeling that comes out of the feeling when love is given. Everybody needs love, including children. They want to be loved. According to the author that I've just quoted, they say children would want to feel love, experience love, hold love, and they just want to be in an atmosphere of love. Children who are loved actually exude uh, that um, I don't fear anything in life. And actually, for kids who do well in school, you can tell that they are loved at home because love is the one thing that is desired by anyone, including children. They need to see love in their parents. They need to understand love when you talk to them. They need to see love even when you hold them, even when you discipline them. They must know that it is done in the context of love. I grew up in a place called Kambuzuma um, in Harare, the sunshine city of this beautiful country that we call Zimbabwe. I want to believe is the land that flows with milk and uh, honey. Now, I grew up in a place of, in, called Kambuzuma, like I said. My mother used to work for a security company, but she had a friend uh, who was uh, working for Kokom. Kokom is a um, um, company uh, that deals with food. But this lady was a well-to-do lady. She was one of the very few people in Kambuzuma back then in the 1980s who was driving a car. She had a VW Volkswagen Golf uh, that she was driving. And, you know, everyone else, including myself, we wanted to be a son of this uh, lady or just a child of this lady because she was driving a car, she was wearing stilettos, uh, putting on um, the current clothes. So everybody wanted to be uh, this lady's child. But alas, hey ho, uh, this lady one time, uh, she, she was a single mother, she came home, and when she came home, her daughter, uh, uh, daughter was called Vanessa, um, and then she was speaking in our local language. She says, ah, mama, into that we one hour. Uh, my Millicent. Who is My Millicent? My Millicent was the lady who was renting just a room um, in, in the home of um, uh, my Vanessa. So the mother couldn't fathom the fact. I mean, every other child in Kambuzuma wants to be my child. My only child wants to be the child of my tenant. Well, it didn't go down well with her. You know, her BP rose to the highest level. So she came to my mom and she says to my mother, you know, they were speaking in Shona, she says, hey, I just don't understand. She wants to be the child of my tenant. When I look at my tenant, she doesn't have a car. She stays in one room. She doesn't even have a radio, a TV, whatever you call it. Why would Vanessa want to be my medicine's child? So my mom says to her, uh, probably just find out what it is that she says she wants to be a child of uh, my medicine. So uh, she went back home after she had cooled down. She called her daughter and says, okay, tell me, why would you really want to be my medicine's child? She says, ah, mama, uh, it's simple. Can my medicine to achieve a She carries medicine, she carries me, she kisses medicine, she kisses me, and she asks us, how was your day? Oh, how I love that one. You know, for Vanessa, it was not so much about the gifts that the mother brought for her, but it was the affection that even the tenant was showing her that she so much desired in her mother. So let me tell you, my beloved parent, you who are watching me right now, your child does not require the presence that you get, but she needs your presence in her life. She needs to feel the love, to see the love, to touch the love, and know that my mother, my father, loves me thus much. So I bid you, I challenge you today, ought to love that child because a love, a child that is loved can show 
that she is loved, he is loved, by the way they carry themselves, not only in the community, but even at school. So let us love the children that God has given under our care. Number two, you ought to train and teach the child the way of the Lord. You know, one of the verses that I love the most in the Bible comes from the book of uh, Proverbs. It says, train up a child in the way that he should go, so that even when he becomes old, he will not depart uh, from um, the way of the teaching. Now, when you teach your children, you ought to do it by example as well as by precept. To use the simplest of things for them to grasp the things that they ought to know in this life. Teach them to be industrious. Train them not to be merely busy, but to engage in useful labor. Teach them that God has claims upon them. Teach them when temptations edge into their paths or selfish indulge to look to Jesus, for he is the author and the finisher of, our, of their faith. Beloved parents, under the dictates of my voice, allow me to suggest today, when you love your child, you ought to teach them and train them to love the Lord their God. But one way we teach our children is to do it by example. It's not merely by telling them how to do it, but they also want to see how we do these things. When we model our children by our lives, children learn more. Actually, you know, for those who study um, child studies, you actually know that children learn more, not by hearing, but seeing what happens. A story is told about Mother Crab. Well, it never happened, but I just want to put across uh, a lesson. They said Mother Crab heard uh, people saying, hey, your children, they're not walking straight. So she was a little bit disturbed. So she called all her children and says, hey, I want you to line up here. Line up, line up, line up. And the kids line up and says, people are saying you are not walking in a straight line. Why is it that you are doing like this? I want children who walk straight. Please, start showing me. How do you walk straight? And the little crabs started moving to the left, to the left as they were moving. And the mother took a short sharp book and said, eh, 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 eh. I don't like children. I said, walk straight. So the kids thought, ah, probably we moved a little bit to the left. So as they were trying to move to the right, they were going more. The mother said, children, I said, I want you to go straight. Straight, straight. You know what is straight? So he started beating with the shampoo. They tried the third time, the fourth time, until one little crab got some guts and said, ah, mommy, this is too much. We tried. The first time we went too much to the left. The other time we went too much to the right. That, now show us, how do you move straight? I tell you, it was a difficult moment for the mother. She was even going backwards, left, right, backwards, left and right. Why? Because the kids said, for us to be able to know what you want us to do, show us the way. Don't just tell your children what to do. Show them what to do. You know, I shudder at times when parents talk about other parents when they are eating with their children. When you go back to church and as if you are trying to uh, put that fake smile, children will know that, no, this is a lie. Because last night we were talking about the very family that you are busy hugging and making as if things are okay. Things are not okay. If you want your children to respect other people, show them how to do it. Don't talk about other people when you are having supper, breakfast, or whatever it is. Show them how you, they ought to go. So you need to teach them diligently. You need them to train them in the way that you should go because that's the way that we ought to do. Remember one thing before I go to point number three. Children are committed to us parents as a precious trust, which God will one day require at our hands. We should give to their training more time, more care, and more prayer. They need more of the right of instruction. Teach your child. Train your child. In case you've forgotten, point number one, love your child. Point number two, teach your child. Let's go to point number three. I love this one. Discipline the child. Can I talk to the 23rd century parents, the contemporary parents, under the dictates of my voice? Uh, you know, we now think that loving our children is to allow them to do things that they want to do any time, any day, any place. No! Actually, God will require of us to discipline our children. Actually, the word disciple comes from the word, uh, the word discipline comes from the same root word as disciple. In as much as we discipline our children, we are disciple them to have the similitude of Christ. Listen to this, friends. 
as we parent our children, we need to discipline them. The Bible, especially the book of Proverbs, has made it so clear that if we need to put our children in the straight and narrow path, we ought to discipline them. Failure to discipline them, we are giving them to shear. A short story. You know, I love telling stories. You know, this uh, mother had problems disciplining her child. You know, you know she said, hey, I find it very difficult to put my hands or to just do anything to my child. How are you doing it? So she was asking another mother. The other mother says, ah, you know what? I found a solution to this problem. I went on Google. I asked Uncle Google and says, how do I discipline my child without me feeling so bad? So that, And then I was directed to a disciplinary machine. So I went on Amazon. I ordered the disciplinary machine. I uh, read what needed to be done. So this disciplinary machine was going to help the contemporary parent who feels very bad when they discipline their child. So how does the disciplinary machine work? Now the disciplinary machine was just a truth and light dictator with hands. What to do is, uh, if you ask a child a question, if they lie, it can dictate that you are lying. So instead of the mother beating, the machine will beat the child. So that they don't feel like they are the one who is actually beating the child. It's just a, a short story. So this lady says, oh, okay, fine. So where did you order it? So they said, no, we ordered it from Taiwan. Um, we went to Amazon. So the other lady ordered the machine. So the father and the mother came and says, okay, fine. This machine looks good. At least we don't have to beat our own child. But we need to test if the machine works. So the father says, okay, fine. Uh, let me try. Um, ask me a question because it had a truth and lie dictator just uh, almost uh, on, on the middle of the, the machine. So the man says, let's test it. We want to see if this thing can work. So the man says, ask me, what is my name? The man was called Joseph. And then the wife asked the man, what is your name? And he said, Peter. So the he was standing in between the machine. And when he says, Peter, the machine went, wah, and gave him a clap and took to the position. He says, ah, I think it works. He says, ask me again, what is your name? Reuben. And then he gave him another clap. He says, ah, okay, it's working. Ask me another name. What is your name? And he says, uh, Andrew. And then he gave him a double clap. He says, mm, I think this thing works. Now ask me for the last time. I want to tell the truth. I want to see if it works. And says, what is your name? He says, Joseph. So the machine remained like this. And the man says, ah, I think this machine works. So they waited for their daughter. She was about 13 years old. When she walked into the home, the parents never told them what was happening. She says, oh, daughter, please come here. And then she just stood in front of the machine. So the mother asked her, so where are you coming from? No, I'm coming from the library. The machine went, wah, gave, him a, gave her a clap. And the daughter was trying to, what is happening here? She says, please tell us the truth. Where are you coming from? She says, no, you know, I had to do my homework. So I went to get him, wah, it gave him another clap. Ah, the daughter could not even fathom what was happening. And then she realized that, mm, something could be going wrong. He says, okay, uh, you know what, uh, to tell you the truth, I went to see Kuda, my boyfriend there, and then, and then the machine remained still. And then the father said, hey, you know what, I want children who tell the truth. Just be like me. I tell your mother the truth all the time. The machine turned and clapped the father one more time. Why? Because he was not always truthful to the father. But we are talking about discipline. Listen, friends, we don't always have to beat our children every time they make a mistake. Sometimes we have to do it, but that's not always the case. We, don't, we necessarily don't need to uh, take the whip and beat them. Sometimes we need to sit them down and talk with them. Um, I've got a boy, his name is called Shekinah. Um, uh, I won't tell you what he did, but <laughs> that day I was very angry. And uh, he did something that I didn't uh, that didn't go down well with me. I just stood from where I was. I picked him by the hand. I started beating him with my hands. And um, well, uh, being a pastor, I then uh, prayed with him. So he went. He played. After a few minutes, he came back to me. And then he was actually three years old then. And he came to me. And says, "You know, you're a very bad pastor." I looked at him. I said, "Hey, do you know who you were talking to?" I mean. I'm your father. How do you say I'm a very bad pastor? I could also beat you for the second time. Of course, I didn't know that he was referring to the... He says, you know, that time when you beat me, you were very angry. And then I paused for a minute, and my wife looked at me, and she was like, yeah, you were very angry. And like, no, you, 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 you are a very bad pastor. Um, 
I did something that I'd never done in my life. I had to apologize to my boy. I said, sorry, Sunny, I beat him. As soon as I finished the apology, I said, yeah, now you are a very good pastor. You know, um, he could tell that when I beat him, I was angry. I want to challenge you parents. Should you discipline your child, don't do it in anger. Do it in a way that your child would appreciate that you want to make him or make her the better person that he or she can be and do it out of love. And this is what God used to do even to Israel. Sometimes when God disciplined, he wanted the best to come out of them. So friends, family, parents, when we discipline our children, let's do it out of, out of love. Let me come to uh, the next point uh, which I want to talk about. Point number four. Invest in your child. Now, parents, this I'm going to speak very passionately. We need to invest in our children. Investment in your child is an asset without risk. Friends, I don't know how I can overemphasize this. The greatest tragedy of the contemporary parents is parents who are expecting so much from their children, yet they've invested nothing. Allow me to tell you this uh, story that happened to my friend. I'll say it in my mother language because, you know, sometimes things are easier expressed in a certain language. You know, for those who are sure, it's just like when you want to say, it's very difficult to say it in English. I had a friend, uh, his name was called Purumero. Uh, we grew up together in Kambuzuma. I told you I grew up in Kambuzuma. He was coming all the way from uh, Mozambique uh, when Zimbabwe used to be the breadbasket of Africa. And uh, in Mozambique, there were quite some... Uh, challenges. So he was now here in Zimbabwe. He was a little bit uh, older than me, but we're still in the same class. So we were staying very close to the gate of the school. Uh, one day, I remember it was a Tuesday, and Purumero um, came home crying profusely. He was crying. So the mother saw the child, and she was very concerned. So she asked him in our local language, why are you crying? I mean, you've left school almost five minutes ago and you're still crying. Uh, but, oh, mama, mama, wana teacher, uchukuru. Waru wana teacher. Wambunya nyo tadzei. Je kuchema kumba, kuchukuru kushika kumba uchichema. Oh, but, oh, mama, ndateza uti mbueno nzichine mchurungu. But, what is she? What? What is she? Ndateza uti mbueno nzichine mchurungu. So, the mother was very angry. While the mother was beating the child, the father walked into the room. So the husband looked at the wife. So can see one is out in the chin of Churung. Ah, to open a elephant. And the husbands know they said, ah, they won't wait till they get it. And that's why in the ah, come on. Now, who is the problem here? The child or the parents? The parents didn't even know what a dog is called in English. So, but the parents were expecting the child to know, yet they've not even invested a single thing in the child for them to tell them what they know. The paradox of this contemporary parenting, they expect a lot from their children. Your child will not wake up one day and start knowing the Bible when you don't even buy them the Bible. Your child will not be able to preach when you don't even show them how it is done. We think it is done by magic, and the child is able to preach. The child is able to be confident in front of children. It is for us to invest in our children, for us to get the best out of our children. So wherever you are, under the dictates of my voice, my mother, my father, wherever you are, invest in your child. It's an asset without risk. You can't wake up one day and hoping that on your yard you will have some mangoes when you never planted a mango. The same with parenting. If you need fruits out of your child, invest in that child. How will your child know about the 12 sons of Jacob, about the 12 disciples, when they don't even have a Bible in their home? Come on, parents. It's easy for your child 
to know about all the Manchester United players because they are always on DSTV watching soccer, but you have never ever even tried to invest in their spiritual life. I remember one time when I was pastoring in a place in Mutare, uh, one parent was fuming when children were called in front and then they asked them to uh, tell them about Bible characters. And the boy looked to the mother and says, uh, John Cena. And the mother was fuming. She said, what are the teachers doing? My child can't even know a single verse. Can't even know. It's not about the teacher. It's about you at home. Charity begins at home. Invest in that child. And when you do so, you will reap great out of it. So remember, invest in that child. Lesson number five. Model your child. To you, my beloved friend, you might be a parent today or an aspiring parent. One of the greatest things you can do to your child is to model them. I don't know if it only happened to me or the kids in my generation. No matter how small your parent is, a child will always believe that their parent is the only one who can deal with issues. Why? Because they looked up to you as their model. I have a friend of mine. He came to me and says, you know what, Pastor, today I was humbled by my child. So I said, what happened? Um, he says, uh, when I got home, my two kids were fighting. So I went to the little brother. I said, hey, you must start listening to your bigger brother. And don't just question your brother on certain things. And he says, oh, but did you don't know what he did? He says, but what exactly did he do? So the bigger brother had actually um, beaten the young brother. Do you know why he beat the young brother? Because the young brother was asking him to pull down um, a poster that he had won at school. What happened? Um, there's a company called Christo Suites. They were doing uh, what in Zimbabwe is known as a road show. So they go to various schools, uh, they bring some sweets, ask questions, give them various gifts. So on this particular day, uh, the Christo company went to their school and they were doing that road show as they were asking them simple questions, they would give them gifts, some would get sweets, some would get pencils. But this bigger brother, his name is Tawona, and the young brother was called Tawana. So Tawana answered a question at school on assembly, and he was given a poster. But this poster had Superman on it. So the young brother was not uh, asked a question, so he never got anything. So the bigger brother came home and uh, stuck his poster of Superman just uh, because they were sharing a room. He was uh, sleeping on the top of the bunk, the young brother on the bottom part. So the bigger brother put his poster where you could see. So anyone who would walk into the room would see that big poster with Superman. So when the young brother walked into the room, lo and behold, he saw the picture of Superman right at the top of the bunk bed. So he went and removed the picture. When the brother came into the room, he said, what happened to my picture? The young brother said, no, I took it down. And the bigger brother said, why did you take down my picture of Superman? He says, no, but why did you put the picture of Superman there? He says, because I wanted school. The bigger brother, because of what had happened, had just got mad and beat the young brother. So when the father was trying to say to the young brother, why, Tawana, why did you take your big picture, your, the poster for your big brother, from his bunk bed. So the young brother says, did, the reason why I did it is because you had put Superman in our room, but I don't want Superman to be our model. I want you to be our model. The father said, my heart melted like chocolate soldiers in the sun. It never hit into me that I am actually a model to my son. And that's when I went into the room just that I was a man, but I could feel tears wanted to trickle down my... I was busy correcting my young child 
but yet he was very true that he wanted me to be the model. And when he told me that story, it also struck to me and made me realize that I should be the model that my children should see. My children should see Christ through me, not anyone else. So my beloved parents, to you my father, to you my mother, be the model that you ought to be. Point number six, play with your child. Allow me, beloved friends, I want to say this with a passion. We are in a generation where parents are busy looking for the green bill, the dollar. That is not bad. It is okay. But not, let's not do it to the neglect of our children. We have become total strangers to our children. Yet our children love to spend time with us. I want to speak to you, my mother. I want to speak to you, my father. Even though we need to fend for our children, we also need to give them quality time where we do certain things with them, clean the car with them, wash dishes with our children, play his caressia, his kabomba, his caressia with our children so that they know that there's that soft spot in my mother, in my father, that I can feel welcome any day, any time. Most children who suffer from failure to thrive syndrome are children who have no time with their parents. You know, a story is told about this boy. Uh, his name was called Jim. Uh, Jim um, uh, said to his father, you know, there's going to be a, a family fun day uh, that we are organizing at school. So I want you, Dad, to come. Uh, it's going to be on a Sunday. We're going to be uh, doing uh, resake, you know, the egg toast, whatever, you know, all those things that we do on a family fun day. Hey, if you have never been to a family fun day, I think you need to repent and start doing that now. So the boy, Jim, said, Daddy, please come to our family fun day. And his father said, Hey, Jim, you know what? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a very big project, and that project is going to give me lots of money. Then I can buy you the bicycle that you've always wanted. I can even take you to that holiday resort you've always wanted. And Jim says, but, but, but please, you, you know, all my friends, their parents are going to be there. Actually, there's going to be a race for parents, and I know you're going to be number one. And says, but, you know, uh, how long is the program? He says, it's only about an hour. He says, hey, you know what? For me, one hour is almost worth, um, let me calculate, I don't even know how much I make in an hour, but I know at least it's more than 500 US dollars in one given hour. So Jim was like, but dad, this thing is about three months from now. You could do something. He says, uh, I don't have that much time. If I lose an hour, I would have lost almost close to 500. He says, dad, did you make that much money in life? And the father was like, yeah, I make that much. So if you make that much, please give me at least $2 every day for my pocket money. And I go to school. He says, no, that's simple. I can actually give you $2 then for me to come for your family fun day. So every day in the morning, Jim would go and knock on his dad's door. He says, daddy, my $2. And the father would always give him $2. He'd go to school. And since the program was three months ahead of the time, you know what Jim did? He never actually used that money. He kept it in his piggy bank. Actually, Two days before the family fun day, Jim came to his dad and says, Daddy, please come for my family fun day. All my friends, their fathers are coming, and I would love to spend time with you. And he says, but Sonny, I told you, in that one hour, I would have made about 500 US dollars. So I would rather go and make that money and buy you the things that you want. And you know what little Jim did? He just went into his room, took his piggy bank, and removed all those $2 notes that he's father was giving him and when he counted actually that time it has gone over $500 and he went to his dad and says daddy would it make you come if I give you all this money that I've been saving just for you to come and play with me and spend time with me so that we can have fun together and you can almost imagine tears stroll down the cheeks of Jim's father because his son really wanted to play with his I want to challenge you, spend quality time with your child. You don't know what you have until it is gone. Time is always in the hands of God, but you can make use of the time you have now with your children. Create memories that if whatever happens in life, memories will never be taken away. Finally, let me talk about the last thing. I said love your child, train your child, discipline your child, Model your child. Play with your child. Finally, pray with your child. 
Allow me to take you to the book of Job. A man who dwelled in the land of Uz. A man who knew how to eschew evil. A man who loved God. A rich man. Rich as he was. He would find time to pray for his children. And he would always say in his mind, perchance my children have sinned against God. I ought to pray. Can I challenge you parents? If Job in that time where the world was not as sin sick as it is today found time every day to dedicate his children to God, what more in a generation where sin has gone beyond human imagination, where things are happening that we don't understand, what more in a generation and time like this is it for us as contemporary parents to pray for our children? Job would say, in case my children have sinned against God, I daily need to dedicate them to our Lord and Savior. Before you leave the home, make it a point. You raise your hands over your kids. Bless them. Pronounce a blessing on them. Pray for them. When they come back from school, you don't know what they went through. Perchance they sinned against God. Rededicate them again into the hands of the Lord. To you, my beloved friends, you might be a parent now. You might be an aspiring parent. What we need to do is to make sure that we parent our children heavenward bound. To prepare them in this world where they are currently living. And also make sure that we create a character that will make them fit for the kingdom to come. I invite you for a word of prayer as we invite the Lord to help us do our parenting duty to the best of our ability. Our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, shall we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you because you are the best parent ever. But as you have made us parent even in this world, we ask and invite that you might give us all that we need to become uh, parents to our children, to prepare them to be useful in this kingdom to mold characters that will make them fit for the kingdom to come. To you, parents, under the dictates of my voice, I say to you in final benediction, have faith in God, his promises are true. Have faith in God, he has never lost a battle. Have faith in God, he give you peace. Peace in your heart and peace in your home. Have faith in God, all things are possible. Through him who gives us strength to become parents who model our children after the similitude of Christ. In Jesus' name, let all the saints say amen and amen. Thank you for watching this episode of Happy Homes. I know you have been blessed. If you have been blessed, just type hashtag Happy Home and pass a comment. Don't forget to like our page. Don't forget to share. And don't forget to invite friends to come and know what it ought to be to create little heavens on this planet. Earth. May the good Lord bless you now and forevermore. Amen.